this time. Mr. Secretary, if you would, please call the roll. Senator Carroll. No response. Senator Caslin. Thank you. Senator Givens. No response. Senator Kerr. No response. Senator McGarvey. No response. Senator Meredith. Present in the room. Thank you. Senator Nemus. Present in the room. Thank you. Senator West. No response. Senator West. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Beckler. No response. Representative Bentley. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Blanton. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Bridges. No response. Representative Dossett. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Fisher. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Fleming. Thank you. Representative Flood. No response. Representative Fugit. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Gentry. No response. Representative Hale. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Hart. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Hatton. No response. Representative Nemus. No response. Representative Palumbo. No response. Representative Prunty. Just for point of reference, she's shown logged in there, so we'll, we may loop back to her in a second. Okay. Representative Raymond. No response. Representative Reed. Here in the room. Thank you. Representative Riley. Here in the room. Thank you. Representative Santoro. No response. Representative Tipton. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Wilner. No response. Chairman McDaniel. Present in the room. Thank you. Co-Chair Petrie. Very well. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Over here, Chair. Representative That's Beckler's right. here. Got in right. one person late. Uh -huh. All right. Real briefly, Representative Palumbo, we see you on the screen here, or at least your name's on. Are you on? All right. Very well. But the fact that she's on tells me we at least got the video conference working. So uh, if there are any other members who are on, um, let us know. All right. With that, we're going to go ahead and dig into our agenda. Uh, first up, we uh, have approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? Uh, Senator Nemus, second by, I think it was Representative, uh, all right, Representative Hale. All right, very well. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Ayes have it. Minutes from the October 6th meeting are approved. All right, first up, we have uh, testimony from Math Nation. If Senator Thayer would like to come on up and give a brief introduction, and then we will get to rolling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here today to introduce representatives from an organization named Math Nation. Uh, originally, Senator Wise uh, was going to be here today, but he had something come up. Uh, so I'm uh, pinch hitting for him this afternoon. Uh, Senator Wise and I are going to be making a budget request for ARPA education dollars, $5 million, $10 million uh, over the uh, biennium uh, to bring Math Nation to Kentucky. It's an online learning tool uh, to help students are, who are behind in arithmetic. And the reason uh, I've been working with Senator Wise on this is I was, I was one of those kids in middle school and high school who really struggled with math. If it weren't for a good friend who was basically a mathematic savant and a teacher who took a little extra interest in me, uh, I, I wouldn't have uh, reached the comprehension level necessary to uh, complete my studies. I wish I would have had something like, like Math Nation to help me back then. Even, even before the pandemic, uh, we know that there are plenty of students around the Commonwealth who are behind in math. And we know coming out of the pandemic that uh, that situation has been exacerbated. One of my superintendents from my district told me, and, and this was a district uh, that um, missed some but not all of the school year, he said it would be 18 to 24 months to get these students caught up. Uh, the uh, JCPS superintendent told me it might be five years for the students in Jefferson County, our largest school district, which of course was shut down for an entire year, as everybody knows. So I've uh, done my research on this program, Math Nation, and it holds personal interest to me. Uh, but I think coming out of the pandemic, uh, it, is, it would be an excellent use 
uh, of the ARPA funds uh, to, uh, to help teachers, parents, and students uh, get these kids caught up uh, in uh, the all-important mathematical sciences. So I appreciate your time and attention today. Uh, these folks have come in from Florida and South Carolina with the hopes of convincing this committee and the General Assembly that Kentucky will become the fifth state to implement Math Nation for its students. So I'm going to leave the chair and let the other ladies come up and introduce you to Ethan Fieldman. He's the president uh, of Math Nation, probably one of those mathematics savants like my friend who helped me get through high school. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to him and let him do the, the introductions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you, Senator. Chairman McDaniel, Chairman Petrie, members of the committee, we appreciate your time uh, very much. We understand that we're first, so we will be very cognizant of time and respectful of your time. I'm Ethan Fieldman. I'm the president of Math Nation. Uh, here with me is, is Morgan Chittum, our, our vice president. I'll let her speak about herself for a moment. Yeah, thank you so much for having us today. I um, used to be a college math instructor and then just felt a passion for K-12 education, math education, the more college courses I taught. Um, and it's really, really good to be here today. I'm actually an Appalachia girl, so it's great to be at a place where they sell L8 in the gas stations. <laughs> Uh, and also, uh, Dana came in, Dana Jenkins came in from South Carolina. She helps run the operation, our project there. And I'll let her speak about herself for a moment. Yes. Thank you, committee, for hearing us. My name is Dana Jenkins. I'm from South Carolina, the co-director um, of the operations in South Carolina, what would be uh, here in Kentucky. And I use these products, I use these resources in my own classroom, and I was able to see um, growth in my students, both in numbers and also in confidence. And I have a great passion for this, and I'm so excited to be a part of the team and to possibly be here in Kentucky. So we're... Very fortunate to have Dana come join us full time. So I'm going to jump right in and uh, just talk about the challenge that we have here in Kentucky. Um, the, there's been many articles about this. We'll just highlight a couple very quickly. But uh, many of the schools have less than 50% of their students scoring at proficient or distinguished levels. Um, certainly math is challenging across the country. But the SAT scores are going down even before the pandemic. So even before the learning loss of not being in school and such, the ACT scores have been going down. In fact, only 25% of Kentucky students were at meeting benchmark in mathematics on the ACT. So certainly something that we need to work on. Also, teacher shortages are expected to expand by over 7%. So we have to do things that we can support the teachers in the classroom. We have to help nights and weekends especially for students to catch up working with their parents. So that's what we, that's what we work on. So data is what's important to us. We, we believe that things should not be funded with any, any sort of funding unless they're making test scores go up. Our value is to make mathematics more fun for students, more exciting, connected to college and career. That's what we do. But it has to be reflected in test scores. And so we've proven over many years now across multiple states that we can bring those test scores up. So just to highlight some of those uh, in, in Title I schools, in the top right, you can see rural students do better, English language learners do better, uh, economically disadvantaged students do better. Math Nation has been proven to do a, a fantastic job. And, and this data, to be clear, is not from us. All of this data is done by university partners that we have in each state. So we work with a university partner in each state to help do evaluation and some other things. So I'm going to give you a very brief uh, history because I like telling the story, but I'm going to be very brief. Uh, we started down in Florida. We're based, Morgan and I are down in North Florida. Um, there was a 52% failure rate on the end of course exam in Algebra 1 in 2012. And the College of Education at the University of Florida said, we got to do something to help teachers and parents and students across the state. And so we did focus groups and we asked teachers what they wanted. And they all really wanted the same thing, which was they wanted videos for students after school where they could choose a different instructor that looked like them and sounded like them as a tutor. Um, they also wanted a workbook to follow along with. We have these workbooks, and there's some of those distributed throughout from South Carolina to give you a sense of having a workbook, especially for students who don't have broadband internet at home, that they can follow along. And they wanted tutoring. They wanted tutoring for every student. Most students can't afford to have a, a private tutor, right? My background originally as an educator was, with, was tutoring student athletes at the college level where they get anything they want, right, at, at any cost. Uh, but most students don't have that, right? Most students don't have that, especially in middle school and high school. And so they wanted tutoring across the state for students at night and on the weekends. A district-by-district district approach. They wanted something that each district that could have its own customizations, and they wanted parent involvement, of course. And again, that was, this is even before the pandemic. So in Florida, Math Nation was adopted by 100% of the districts with no state mandate. The districts decided they want to use it. By 2017, we had enormous gains in the pass rates. 
of the end of course exams. And then we expanded to geometry and middle school math and algebra two and other courses. And now we're statewide in multiple states and we help all students, all students, public school students, private school students, adult education, community colleges, anyone who wants access, we want to give them access. So that's very important. And then we work with a local university, as I mentioned, to help us with the standards alignment and the evaluation every year. We have a great quote from the commissioner uh, from the state superintendent of Mississippi. We can, you have a copy of that in the PowerPoint. You can take a look at it. And now I'm going to show you just a very quick piece of a video of some of the things that we do for students. Now that you've seen the data, this is how we do it. So we have instructors. I'll turn up the volume here for you so you can hear it. Now we're going to have that conversation again about equations, graphs, and tables. But now we're relating all three. Match the equations, tables, and graphs, noting any key features you use to determine those matches. Let's get to it. But when we look at the real world context, we realize that there are some additional constraints on the domain and range. So what do you think this graph would look like if it were drawn to represent that real world context and not just the equation or function that represents the context? So in states where they like it in Spanish, we do in Spanish as well. But the key is that students can choose different instructors who have all gone through and recorded every single thing they need according to state standards for that particular state, which is what we do. We set up an operation in each state, and we make things perfect for that state. We use local examples, local businesses. I'm involved in workforce development myself, my other volunteer hat. Uh, and so we, we bring students to real companies and real jobs. So that's part of what we do. In their phones, on their computers, they have access to these tutors every night and on the weekends. And as you can see, they can choose between them. Some of them go more in depth. If a student misses school or, they, or the teacher assigns, say, look, this student missed a whole chunk of these this week or that week, the teacher or the tutor goes through and explains everything they need to know. But sometimes students just need a quick refresher. That's all they need. And so they can choose someone different from, from the list. So our, our study experts, as we call them, because tutor is not necessarily the most fun word for students. So study experts are sometimes uh, looked upon as rock stars. So we'll show you, we, we started uh, filming when we visit schools with the local study experts, the local tutors. Kind of a neat thing to see. So the students are very excited to meet their meet their tutor, believe it or not. You know, in math, you don't have you don't have guest speakers in math usually, right? You don't have uh, field trips. So having these celebrity uh, involvement with math instructors is definitely something that folks haven't seen before. Now we also have the workbooks, and then you saw in the videos that the instructors, our study experts, are going through things. And so students each get a workbook; they can put their names on it. It's a line of state standards. We put. Uh, the universities we work with on the front cover, real companies that we interview, and we do math about real jobs in the state. So that's, that's the key. Each student gets one of these, and they can make it their own. We also have remediation tools. We have on-ramp tools. So they basically, if you're going into sixth grade, you got to know all the things from usually third grade through fifth grade in math. So we make sure that it remediates them the first week of school so that all these students coming with different learning loss from different schools, the teacher has a tool that each student can have a personalized path, an adaptive path, to get them right back to where they need to start to get that school year start out right. And then math in action. Math in action is where we go on location with real companies. This is one from Boeing in South Carolina. All of the 787s are built at a, at a facility in Charleston, South Carolina. So we went, we got behind the stage, seeing access to, uh, to work with Boeing to make these. I'll show you just a quick one minute clip of uh, interviewing engineers about real jobs in that state. Here with our new friend Kaylee, and I'm going to let her. Um, we're going to be doing a couple of videos with her, but for now, I'm going to let her go ahead and tell you a little bit about herself because she's actually a South Carolina girl. That's right. Hey guys, my name is Kaylee. I was born and raised in Anderson, South Carolina. Went to Westside High School. Go Rams! Uh, after I graduated high school, I attended Clemson University where I studied mechanical engineering. 
Uh, when I got into it, it was a little tough. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do or what a career might look like, but I really, really enjoy uh, being an engineer, especially in the aerospace industry. I especially want to give all my girls a shout out just because you might be a little bit outnumbered or might not look like everyone around you doesn't mean it's not where you're meant to be. Uh, the industry is fun, it's creative, you're solving challenges and puzzles every single day. Uh, so get out there and follow your heart, especially if you like math and science like I did growing up. Uh, so this is the part that's being made in this machine right, so here, right now. Yes. Okay, so this, I'm looking at this and this seems like... It's a little laggy on the video, but she actually shows machining a part for a 787 and then on a whiteboard draws out the math problem so that teachers and students can have a lesson activity in class that they can use if they choose. They don't have to, but they can use these lessons of real companies in that case in South Carolina, in this case in Kentucky. Now, as far as tutoring. Well, the way that you tutor literally tens of thousands of students in a course across the state is we built this thing called the wall, Algebra 1 wall, Geometry wall, where students can go online. It looks like social media, but it's not. They can't friend each other, message anything, but it looks like things they're used to. And they can ask questions to each other, and we hire local teachers across the state to monitor it at night and on the weekends. So students are sort of tutoring each other, but not really tutoring each other. They're guiding each other to the right videos and the right resources. And it happens thousands of times every night where students are helping each other across states. And they get unlimited access to do as much as they'd like to ask all the questions. So when they show up the next day in class, the teacher says, my students usually don't show up with their homework done because they got stuck. Well, now they can get unstuck because we hire local teachers after school across the state to help students across, which is really key. I can speak to this as a parent and as a teacher. It's invaluable as a teacher to be able to have this support for my students. So if they go home and I know they have emails, or they're going to send me emails, or parents are going to send me emails, this is a support that I can offer them. If I'm not available, if I'm taking care of my own children or my own family, this is a support that's available um, in my parents that I teach. And as a parent, I love it. And then as a teacher, I can't tell you how invaluable that was. Yeah. The access is universal. We work with all hardware devices across all districts. There's nothing to download. We have, a, we have an app that goes back more than six years because a lot of the students have hand-me-down cell phones. They don't have the, the brand new iPhone that I have. They've got these older phones. We go back more than six years. Also for, for students with, with broadband issues, everything is downloadable at school while they're on the internet. Then when they're on that long bus ride or they're at home without good internet, they can do everything on their phone, including watching the videos. Then when they get back to school, it syncs back up on the Wi-Fi. They can go to a, a McDonald's or anything to get Wi-Fi just to get it or school, and they go home and they can watch it. So very important to us to make sure. I live in rural Florida. I know people think of Florida as a very urban area, but there's a lot of rural areas in, in Florida like where I live, and it's very important to us that our students have access, and it's always been that way. I won't play one for you now, but we also have family support videos. So parents can actually learn exactly what their students are learning exactly. They can see all of it. They can track their students. And the videos are actually tailored to parents. So we have a whole set for parents to understand that they can help their student at home. Because I don't know if you all remember Algebra 1 or factoring polynomials very well, but, but most of us, I know, have forgotten that. Uh, so with that, uh, I would love to have a discussion, talk about questions. We're, we're educators, so we prefer not to give a lecture. We prefer to have questions. But, uh, but thank you, Chairman. And guys, and thank you for your brevity of your presentation today. We sincerely appreciate it. Um, at this time, I will throw it open. Representative Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you all being here today. You know, numeracy, literacy, those are key components. Uh, I've actually met and spoken with Superintendent Wright before Mississippi. And, uh, you know, they passed a landmark legislation in 2013 on literacy. And they also, they didn't really impact numeracy at that time, but they've seen an increase mm -hmm. in, their, in their numeracy scores. Have, have you all been in contact and, and had discussions with Kentucky Department of Education on this yet? Representative, yes. Um, and the scores across Mississippi statewide have gone up dramatically in, in mathematics and the courses that we help them with. Not that it's just us, but, yeah. but we, we like to say we've played a small part. They've done a fantastic job in Mississippi. Um, we did. We met with the commissioner, uh, and um, he expressed that he definitely saw the value, and if there was legislative uh, approval, that he would be happy to help us implement. Uh, one more follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned that you partner with a university uh, in Kentucky. Uh, of course, we already have a university in Kentucky that's involved in math intervention. Uh, I didn't know. How, how do you go about your selection of the university that you partner with? That's a great question. Uh, we, may, we may need two or three uh, in, in, in Kentucky, is my understanding. Um, we, uh, we like to work with institutions that are teacher prep, training teachers, typically, um, because they're the most um, – 
you know, they're the most on the ground with teachers all day, and they can help us get the word out and help have that teacher involvement because we build a new system in every state, to be clear. This is not a national program. We don't use any national standards. We just take some of the technologies. We don't have to, we don't have to reinvent the wheel and spend $50 million every time to build something. So we select them based – everyone we've ever contacted has wanted to work with us on the program. So it's really just a matter of finding those that, that have access to those teachers and they're on the ground and understand what teachers need in the classroom to help students. Thank you, Representative Hart. I just have one uh, real quick question. Do you all have any programs that is geared specifically to uh, parents that homeschool their children? Yes, and I, I may have missed it in the, in the presentation, but we have many. We open it up to everyone. So many homeschool parents email us every week, and we give them access immediately. Especially as a homes, I mean, homeschool parents, especially ha knowing that something aligns to state standards in Kentucky is very important because when you go on YouTube or you start looking for videos online, it might be Common Core, it might be another state, it might be something else. It's not going to be the math that the student is is learning that year. Now, two plus two equals four. To be clear, like we're not saying this, the math is different, but. Venn diagrams are taught in eighth grade in some states. They're taught in seventh grade in other states. So it's important to have perfect alignment to state standards. So that's why homeschool parents especially appreciate what we do, that they've got the full access to everything they need in math for their students to do well in the ACT and other tests. All right. Thank you. Representative Raymond. Thank you all. Um, I'm I'm asking this question as the mother of a uh, first grader and a second grader. Um, so my students are in uh, my kids are in JCPS, and in the last 24 hours, I've had them on Exact Path and Zern. Um, not if you're aware of these yes. competitors, right? And so it feels like as a parent of public of, of students in public schools, we're always being given like the new next best thing, and it may be better. It may very well be better. But the herky jerky, like constant change, constant new program, new login, next best thing, this is best for your kid, um, I think damages trust, right, with families and can affect the consistency of the education. If you all would speak to that piece, how you've navigated it, and then I have a follow up. Yeah, as a parent, I, I agree 100 percent, right? There's different things moving around across districts all the time, uh, Representative. The a few things. First of all, you said another login. One of the things we do is we never give them another login. We work with every district individually so that students don't have to have another password that we're right inside of that district. That's, that's number one. Uh, number two, very importantly, having something that they know no matter where they move across the state or what they do, that they have access to something that is state aligned. We, we know the companies that, that you've talked about. We're not really a competitor because what we do is we go statewide work with those standards, work with the local universities, and tailor something to the state of Kentucky. So it's a little bit different, but, but certainly there, those are math programs as well. The key is to make something that they've got a workbook that goes home with them, the parents see exactly what they're learning, they've got videos to go along with it, and they've got that choice, right? The, the teachers, the students, and the parents all have choice between instructors or how they want to use the program. We are not a prescriptive program where it's you log in for 45 minutes every day and you do this and the system just figures it out and, you know, you know photocopies your brain or something like that. Our system is much more transparent, simple, easy to access for parents. And that's the key. The key is to make this fantastic for parents so they can help their student at home and on, on the weekends especially. Does that answer the question, Representative? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, I think just we as committee members would need a lot of clarification on how we think KDE would, would utilize this and how districts would, right? Where would it be mandatory? Where would it be optional? Where would it be covering the day's assignment versus where would it be covering a student's needs, which are often quite different? Um, and then I'll just chime in and say, I guess I'm old school, but um, more time on screens um, gives me the willies after the last two years. Representative, but, if, I, if, I may, if I may clarify something, we don't believe in mandate. I know you said some may be mandated, may not. We don't believe in any mandates. We, we've never mandated anything across all these districts. Um, we believe that each individual district, we hire local staff, local teachers. We typically hire three or four full-time former math teachers to travel around the state, work with each district individually for their own needs. It is not a state requirement in any state that we've ever worked on, never will be, um, but it's something that each district can choose how they want to use it. At the lowest level, just to make this very clear, at the lowest level, even if a teacher is not using the classroom, which many do not, they just know that when the kids go home at night, the parents and the students have access to every single benchmark and standard that the state of Kentucky needs students to learn, to be ready for college and career. So it's, it's really meant as a supplement outside of school for tutoring and to keep those students up. But we work with each, each district to do that. Does that. I just want to make sure to clarify that, that, that we work with each district individually, work with how they would like to use it. 
if, if we go forward with it, I actually would like it to be integrated with schools. We don't need to give families another, another thing. Uh, it's tough to navigate resources as a parent, but I, I'm getting closer to getting it. Thank you all. Agreed. All right. Thank you, Representative Raven. Anybody else on the committee? All right. Thank you guys very Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Representative Prenny. Thank you. Just a comment. I, I, I mentioned to Representative Hart, it's great to have rock stars who are academic and not necessarily athletic or music. So thank you for that. Agreed. Well, guys, thank you for making the sojourn to the Commonwealth today. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Next up, we have uh, Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, I believe Secretary Johnson has joined us today along with Mrs. Smith by Zoom. I'm here. Uh, hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Great. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for having us here today to discuss the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, the Kentucky Finance Cabinet is excited to be a part of this very successful program that is helping so many Kentuckians. Um, however, finance was not best equipped to serve the community intended to benefit from this program. So we entered into an MOA with the Kentucky Housing Corporation. They had the expertise the experience and the leadership to effectively respond to this community. Through this MOA, the Kentucky Housing Corporation has done an outstanding job of quickly developing a program and administering it. From the beginning, Wendy Smith, the Deputy Executive Director of Housing Programs with the Kentucky Housing Corporation, has been an integral part of leading uh, the Healthy at Home Eviction Relief Program. Therefore, to provide you with the in-depth overview that you have requested, I have asked Ms. Smith to join us, and I want to turn it over to her uh, right now to give you that uh, overview. Thank you so much, Secretary Johnson. Um, hopefully, everybody can see my slideshow now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Great. So, um, again, uh, I'm Wendy Smith. Deputy Executive Director of Housing Programs at Kentucky Housing Corporation. I'm gonna to try to anticipate the questions you all might have about this program with a um, pretty dense, but I'll keep it brief slideshow. And then I'm happy to take your questions um, at the end. Um, I imagine uh, there'll be something I've left out. So um, I just wanna make sure everyone knows what Kentucky Housing Corporation is. We go by KHC as our acronym. We are a quasi-state agency, so we're administratively attached to the finance cabinet, but we are self-supporting. We're not part of the state budget. We don't get any general fund support. We earn kind of our own keep, if you will, through program administration and some lending programs. We are what's known as a state housing finance agency. Every state has one, and we are Kentuckys. Our mission is to invest in quality housing solutions that are affordable, um, for families in Kentucky's across, for families and communities across Kentucky, because we believe that when a family can afford their housing, it makes them stable and allows them to thrive, and then in turn keeps their community stable and can allow their community to thrive. We know more and more local officials and state elected officials are concerned about affordable housing, and that's what we're all about. So. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail, but just so you all know, we take a lot of different funding sources, private through the banking industry, federal dollars primarily through HUD, but in this case through treasury, and some state dollars, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and they come to KHC and then we invest them across the state in projects, in nonprofits, you know, in partnerships, all, all kinds of stuff, grants and loans across the state. We work on behalf of home buyers and existing homeowners. So we do mortgage loans, we do foreclosure prevention, we do home repair. Um, and when I say we do it, we don't do the work, we fund it in a partner somewhere across the state. Again, that might be a developer or a nonprofit or a public housing agency, it all depends on what the effort is. We do a lot around rental housing. Um, we fund the creation or renovation of rental housing all across the state. We also operate a Section 8 voucher program for 87 counties. And lastly, we oversee HUD funding for a range of homelessness programs for 118 counties, basically everywhere but Jefferson and Fayette. Okay, so let me focus on the program that you all have asked us to talk about, which is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. 
or we call it ERA. Uh, this is a, a program that is funded through US Treasury as part of COVID relief legislation. That legislation, um, I'm not gonna remember what the, the acronym stands for, we call it CRISA. It was passed December 27th of 2020. So um, just at the end of 2020. Uh, it, this is US Treasury funding. It has come to the Commonwealth of Kentucky, specifically to the finance cabinet. Um, and it is intended to assist tenants and really by assisting tenants, it assists landlords and utilities. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, we are the primary subrecipient and administrator for the finance cabinet, Kentucky Housing Corporation. We are offering rent and utility relief um, to 118 counties. And we have for this first um, set bucket of funding from treasury, we have until September of next year to utilize these funds. The funding amount that came to the Commonwealth was just over $264 million. Louisville and Lexington, those urban counties each got their own direct grant from Treasury. Louisville's was just under 23 million. Lexington's was 9.6 million. So the total to the entire state was almost $297 million. Um, put a little more simply, this is just a, a recap of that. What I want to note for you all is that because Louisville and Lexington really did not get a proportionate share of the funding based on their population share of the state, we have given them additional subgrants out of our bucket of funds. So we, a couple months ago, transferred $27 million to Louisville and $11.7 million to Lexington. That's in addition to the direct grant they each received from Treasury. So we've collaborated, the three of us, since the legislation passed at the end of December last year. We began meeting weekly in January and then bi-weekly, and now we're meeting once a month. We wanted to make sure our programs were virtually identical in terms of the assistance offered, because plenty of landlords cross or utilities cross between our jurisdictions. And we didn't want them to feel like uh, just by virtue of where someone lived, they got more or less. Um, we all use some of the same program documents. Um, and we all launched in mid-February of this year. The funds came over from Treasury in January, and we launched in February. Um, you all, in terms of federal funding, that's light speed for, for the, the legislation to happen in December and a program to launch in February. We, we've never done anything uh, quite that quickly. So um, setting aside the Louisville and Lexington programs, the program that we operate for the balance of state or 118 counties is called Healthy at Home Eviction Relief or HHERF. Uh, the roles with this, so the funding, the grantee is the finance cabinet. We are the primary administrator. The public protection cabinet has built our online application and file processing system um, and manage a lot of data and reporting for us. And then again, we've done subgrants to Louisville and Lexington. The purpose of the fund is to help Kentucky tenants with rent and or utilities to keep them housed. Um, a, a, another goal is to allow landlords and utilities to get substantial payments for arrears. Um, in particular, KHC has an interest in private landlords getting paid and staying afloat because a lot of what's called naturally occurring affordable housing across the country and Kentucky is owned by private landlords. And if they were to fall behind on their mortgage, taxes, insurance, that's not good for renters across the state. So we see this as a vital way to help landlords and to help utilities that may be missing a lot of payments, particularly municipal utilities. Um, and then a third goal is to reduce the volume of eviction cases in Kentucky courts. Our court system does not need an avalanche of cases coming to them. We serve 118 of Kentucky's 120 counties. Again, there are other, other programs operating for Fayette and Jefferson. All three of us refer folks to each other via our websites and phone calls and customer service. That website is teamkyhherf.ky.gov. Um, it has tons of programmatic information, lots of detail, lots of sample documents, income calculator, all that kind of stuff. So um, for eligibility, tenants have to be renting a unit in one of our 118 counties, and they have to earn an income that's at or below area 80% of area median income. 
we turn away very few households because they're over income. This is a broader income range than we typically get to serve, which is really nice. We often can only serve the poorest Kentuckians. Now we can serve really moderate income all the way to the poorest Kentuckians. Um, they had, they, the assistance comes in the form of lump sum direct deposit payments to landlords and lump sum direct payments to utilities. Some utilities require a paper check, some will accept electronic payment. Um, so we do both with utilities. Um, once in a great while, in less than one half of 1% of our, our payments, a payment is made directly to a tenant. And that is in the case when a landlord refuses to participate or we simply cannot get them to respond. We've only had about 150 of those out of tens of thousands of payments, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So I, I wanna make it clear that really the, the payments for this program, the lion's share are going to landlords and then a significant portion to utilities and less than one half of 1% directly to tenants. We can help with back rent dating back to April of last year but we're only allowed to help with a maximum of 12 months of arrears for rent and or utilities. So we can go, we can offer you one month of arrears if that's all you need, we can do 12 months. No matter how much you get in arrears, you also get three months of future utilities or rent. The reason for that, that's the most we're allowed to do at any one time. It also allows us not to have tenants reapplying to KHC every single month, we just could not handle that volume and get folks processed. So we help folks out with a giant lump sum, get them uh, caught up, get them ahead on their payments and buy them and their landlord some stability. Um, we also allow for third party folks to help with an application. That can be a church member, a family member, a caseworker. Um, they're allowed to help the tenant apply and there's a place on the application for them to enter their information. Um, so tenants and landlords, they apply online. Uh, they have to create an account online. We do have a customer call center that if somebody just cannot do the application and cannot get a helper to do it with them, we will do it with them over the phone. Sometimes we schedule a time where they go to the public library and we go get on the phone with them. Um, there's an income eligibility calculator on the website where you can put in the county you live in, how many people live in your unit, and your income for 2020 or for the last 30 days, and it'll let you know if you're eligible. You don't have to create an account to check your eligibility. And again, a, a third party can help. That can be informal, again, a friend or a family member, or it can be a for, someone who's got a formal relationship. That just lets us speed it along, particularly for elderly or disabled applicants. Oops, sorry for zooming so fast. So depending on what the, the tenant is in arrears on, we can help with rent, utilities, or both rent and utilities. It can be either or or both. This is just an income um, uh, matrix as an example for you all. So if we're talking about someone in, we'll just take the first row, Adair County with three persons in their household, they can earn $3,200 per month and still be eligible for this assistance. So it is a, it's a wide range of folks that, that are eligible. So to give you a sense of where we are with this program, we launched February 15th. Um, so we make payments every Friday. So as of last Friday, November 12th, we have paid out in assistance a little over $80 million across the Commonwealth. That does not include what Louisville and Lexington have used of their subgrants. Um, so these numbers are just for KHC. I can talk about Louisville in a, in a minute. We have made over 22,300 individual payments because some tenants have rent and utility that they need help with. So they may have two or three payments that we make on behalf of their household. Um, we have assisted over 16,000 renter households across Kentucky. The average assistance is just under $5,000. That's all together rent and utilities. Um, we are, we've been doing a lot of marketing since August because our application numbers had kind of gone down. We've got over any, any backlogs that we had. So we started a lot of marketing in August. And over the last six weeks, we have received over a thousand applications per week. Um, that means that marketing is working. It also means we've got to continue to stay at a high pace of payouts because uh, my guess would be some Kentuckians did not know that the program existed. 
Um, I also can share, we have gotten some more fraudulent applications. So some of that number is robo applications that we are having to weed through, you know, and deny and sweep out of our system. Um, and again, 99% of our payments have gone directly to landlords and utilities across the state. So when you look at the numbers all together, add them all up for the past nine months, again, we subgranted 38.7 million to Louisville and Lexington. KHC has paid out a little over 80 million in assistance to tenants for rent and utilities and a little bit of internet help. We've used $5.2 million in administrative costs. So altogether, that totals $124 million that has been committed out of these grant funds, which is 47% of the grant. That is something KHC has never done in this time frame. We still have $122.8 million remaining to help Kentuckians for the next, not quite a year. Right, and so we it, it will keep the program going uh, and may even keep it going beyond that deadline with a second tranche of funding coming from Treasury. This is just the rate of payments per month. So you can see we had a slow start in March and then it uh, really ramped up in the spring. And in the summer, we really uh, hit a good pace. Last month, we brought on a vendor to process applications alongside our staff. And we paid out last month alone $18 million. Um, that's obviously a record for us and a really significant jump in productivity for us. This is a set of data from the administrative office of the courts that helps us at least um, get a correlation uh, on the moratoriums that have been in place on evictions as well as rent assistance and how that relates to forcible detainer filings in Kentucky courts. This data is for all 120 counties. So when you look at the blue line, that's pre-pandemic 2019. The orange line is last year, 2020. You can see when the courts closed entirely for a little bit, there were no filings whatsoever. There were also moratorium, a moratorium in place. The green line is this year up until I think late September. Um, and so what you can see is obviously last year evictions really went down or eviction filings, excuse me, went down. They did come back up as landlords realized the moratorium wasn't on all evictions. It was only on non-payment of rent. And there were reasons that did allow a landlord to evict. But when you look at the green line compared to the blue line, you can see that even with the moratorium lifting, uh, we are still seeing eviction rates, eviction filings at a far lower rate so far compared to 2019. That tells me that we're having an impact I can't say it's causal, it's definitely just a correlation, but it, it makes me hopeful that this work, surely $80 million getting to landlords and utilities is gonna make a difference in housing stability, the stability of those landlords, those utilities and, and those communities. I just wanted to make sure you all, if you get this electronically, this is a flyer with a link to the flyer, if you wanted to share it with any of your constituents. I also wanted to make sure that the committee members know that there will be a program launching late this year or early next year for homeowners who have been impacted by the pandemic. Those dollars are coming directly to Kentucky Housing Corporation. And I just offer you this information because folks can sign up to be notified as soon as that opens. Again, that's gonna be for homeowners. And I offer some web links just so you have links to a lot of information. And I thank you for your time, and I welcome your questions. Wendy, thank you very much for uh, your work and your uh, plowing through a lot of material in a short amount of time. We sincerely appreciate it. We're going to start with Representative Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just wanted to ask, uh, I guess, Ms. Smith, she went over a nice, uh, good detail of what's involved and so forth. But I wanted to ask her uh, in regards to once uh, an application is submitted, What's the time frame for the um, landlord to receive that check and what's involved with that? And the second question is this, and that is uh, just looking at your chart, uh, and I'm interpreting things, but you said that $5.2 million in terms of administration costs uh, with a grant of like $124 million, that's about a 4% uh, cost. Is that about, is that, am I interpreting this correctly? And is that normal or, how, or is that can be compared with anything else? So basically, I have two. We're allowed. 
That's it. I'll answer your second question first because it's easier. <laughs> um, we're allowed 10% admin, so we are well under the allowable amount uh, for sure. We do feel like we've been operating it um, on a shoestring. Um, we have been using some temp staff and, and a lot of existing staff have been reallocated to it. So, um, you know, I, I do feel like that's low. It will go up because what our vendor has just begun invoicing us. So that number is going to go up. Um, but again, we're allowed 10% of the grant, the overall 264 million in admin. So we're nowhere near utilizing all that admin. The first question, which is how long does it take and what's involved for a landlord to get payment? That's a really tricky question. What I can tell you is this, if we get a complete application from the landlord and a complete application from the tenant, they both go online and fill it out. They don't have to do it at the exact same time, but we will link them up by virtue of their address or their email accounts. If we can get complete information and we have really reduced how much documentation we require as treasury allows more and more flexibility, we can process within two to three weeks. Getting complete information is the trick. We need to get a lease. We need either in our online portal or as an upload, a ledger. You know, we need that landlord to tell us what's been paid and what hasn't. Um, we need proof that the landlord owns the property. We will look it up in the PDA if we can do that and prove it that way. So once we get the complete information, again, it's two to three weeks before we send that direct deposit payment. But I don't want to mislead you all. Folks apply and then don't get us everything. And we have to call and ask for you know, a lease or for them to complete the ledger. So it may take more than that. Some of it also depends on the volume of how many applications we have in the pipeline. We got, by August, we were over our backlog and we were processing in one to two weeks complete applications. So some of it is dependent on how much flow is coming in in terms of demand. And one more follow-up question, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you. Um, you said that uh, I guess it's a timing mechanism between the uh, the two applications going through the process, um, and I, you said that you also try to connect the two. Uh, what what are you experiencing? Is that more of a significant issue, or is it more of a minor issue in terms of trying to get those things coordinated in order to get that get it processed? Uh, it, 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 the answer is both. There are many many landlords uh, who seem to be really getting the swing of helping their app, their tenants apply, getting them to apply and moving it to getting their assistance. So we are seeing landlords manage to apply on multiple properties where they have a lot of tenants in arrears. And then we also see situations where there, there might have been a previously contentious relationship between the two parties. And it's tougher to get each one side or the other to participate and to get all their stuff in. So um, it has generally worked pretty well. Once they get their applications in, we can usually marry them up and, and move it forward. But it really runs the gamut, as all landlord-tenant relationships do. Some are really good, and we can move it fast. Others, one party is more interested than the other. And then I want to make it clear, landlords do not have to participate. And some, even though they will experience a financial loss, have made the decision that they want to evict, and they're going to move forward with evicting and don't, don't want to participate in the program. Thank you, Ms. Smith, uh, Ms. Smith, and thank you, Chairman. Very well. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you guys very much for being here today. We sincerely appreciate it. All right, last up, we have AOC uh, talking about technology upgrades for virtual hearing equipment. Uh, let's see, do we have – oh, in person. Still adjusting to who's on what, but thank you, ladies, both very much for being here today. It is. Hopefully you're not having as much difficulty implementing this as we are getting your slideshow up.
just have to do it from the preview option. It's not going to. It looks like we're just going to have to do it like this. We have to wing it. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm Carol Henderson. I'm AOC's budget director. And I'm Elizabeth Lucas um, with ITS at the AOC. So thank you, Chairman, members of the committee, for the opportunity to be here today to update you on the progress of several legislatively funded projects um, that were appropriated um, in uh, earlier this year and funding became available in July. For the purposes of our discussion today, we have conjoined uh, the video arraignment and the video conferencing systems to one project. So there's one slide to update you on that project. And then each of the other projects have a slide as well. So before we get started, a couple of project challenges, and I've heard some of these challenges in prior presentations today, so we are not alone in our challenges. Um, resources are, are definitely a challenge in this particular environment that we are all in today, whether it's uh, securing programming resources or business analysts. It's a highly competitive workforce, as you know. We onboarded 16 folks between July and October, and already one of those has departed for another opportunity. So it's an ongoing um, effort to constantly staff these projects, but we are, we are currently staffed for all of the projects um, in question. Equipment availability is another big issue, as many of you are probably aware. We can get equipment in for our testing, for research and development, but ordering in bulk provides its own unique challenge as the, it's just not available. So we're continuing to place orders as we can. We're continuing to get equipment in for testing and research and development purposes. Stakeholder interest is a third challenge. We're heavily reliant on our judicial partners and our stakeholders to drive the interest and to drive the implementation in these projects. And one of the uh, presenters today shared with us uh, some of the technology limitations, particularly in remote areas of our state, whether it's the courtroom or the jail. Certainly bandwidth has provided a challenge throughout the last year as I'm sure many of you have been aware and have seen that in some of your remote meetings. We have constantly been assessing bandwidths in our courthouses and providing updates where available, but we are somewhat limited by the services that are available in those areas as well. I think another big um, limitation is funding for ongoing costs, whether it's maintenance or support of software or equipment. That's always a challenge. The one-time investment clearly is an initial cost, but there's the ongoing costs associated with all these projects. And then last, I think, but not least, solutions need to be simple, they need to suit the purpose for which they're intended, and they need to be sustainable. And in our language, that means they need to be flexible enough to change as the environment changes. Last but not least are our ongoing support of all of our Kentucky Court of Justice systems. We have over 70 projects currently underway and more than 280 applications which we support. So with respect to video arraignment and conferencing, which is our next slide, we put together a timeline to represent where we are in the process. A lot of, of research and development is still underway. We have a team in place. We have stakeholders in place and you can see the list of those stakeholders below the timeline. Um, where we are right now is building out a room at the administrative office of the courts to be a showcase courtroom where we can test potential solutions and make sure that they work so that we, when we implement in the field we understand what the challenges are and can address those challenges. Um, we are a Zoom platform preferred agency, although we also are a Microsoft Office shop, so that means we also support Teams. So we have a lot of people using a lot of different solutions throughout the state, but those are the ones that we're working to support. So at this point in the, that particular project, we are at the proof of concept stage almost with two counties, two jails, um, Campbell County and Warren County. So we will be looking to work with those jailers um, and the court to implement a pilot project, um, hopefully next month or early in 2022. The next project is the self-represented litigant portal. I know there's been a lot of interest in this particular project. Um, again, we have onboarded our resources, so they are ready to begin work. We have also spent a, a lot of time on research of tools 
for online interviews, guided interviews, so that people can walk up to a terminal, enter information, the form system fill, they can sign it and they can uh, send those and to the clerk for processing. So we're working on a lot of different avenues for the self-represented litigant portal. You can see kind of in the middle of that timeline where we have guided interviews for small claims, probate, and domestic violence. Um, we have also worked with the stakeholders to identify potential other projects where we could leverage some of the knowledge um, from the self-represented litigant portal project. Um, we're meeting with the Access to Justice Commission that is chaired by Justice Keller um, as well as the Office of Language Access to ensure that our self-represented litigant portal offers other languages besides English. And so we have other people who can also use those services. We're also going to be building a guided interview for divorce. So that's the next um, guided interview that we're looking at developing. And then on into early next year, we're looking at pilot programs. We're going to assist, assist with the launch of the self-help center in Fayette County and also a evaluate additional um, devices that potentially could be placed in courthouses, whether that's a kiosk, whether that's additional patron stations, so that self-represented litigants can use those devices to do their work for court. Again, the stakeholders are listed on the bottom of that slide. I will say that all of these projects have had an initial kickoff in October. Additional meetings have been scheduled in November for the stakeholders, and still others are in December. So those committees, those stakeholder groups will be meeting about every month or every other month, depending on the need. The next project is the Redaction System Software Project. Um, this is needed to redact personal identifiable information from court documents from the moment they are e-filed so that uh, information that shouldn't be available publicly is not available publicly. We have made a lot of, of progress on this particular project. We have, were in a proof of concept earlier this year. We have actually secured our license from CSI. It's an IntelliDact is the name of the product. We just received a license last Friday. So now we are in project planning stage with the vendor who is CSI. In the next few months, we'll be looking at hardware provisioning. Um, the redaction software will take some configuration, and it's actually smart software, so it learns as it goes. So the more documents that it processes, it, it learns where that information is on those documents and is able to move forward faster. Next year also, we'll be looking with integration with our KY Court suite of applications and a pilot later in the fall of next year. Again, the stakeholders are listed at the bottom of that slide. And last but not least, the self-service kiosks. These are designed to take um, cash for folks who wish to pay fines and costs. This is an expansion of our ePay program, which we expanded last year in the middle of the pandemic so that all fines and costs could be paid online. So people will be able to pay online, or they can come to the courthouse, pay electronically using a kiosk, or they can still see the clerk. So there'll be plenty of options for folks to actually pay fines and costs. Additionally, there's some um, hope that we will expand the self-service kiosks in, al in alignment with the self-represented litigant portal, that these two will eventually ha have some synergy, such that the patron stations used for the self-represented litigants and the kiosks used for payment purposes. Um, right now, we are working with the vendor, Keefe, who is a state contract vendor, and we are in the middle of contract negotiations with them. Um, in next year, we plan to implement a pilot uh, site early in the year and then complete the rollout of phase one, which would be a rollout of 15 kiosks statewide in key locations, predominantly the larger jurisdiction counties, and then phase two, I'm sorry, phase one also includes the rollout of convenience stores using a QR code so that folks can go in, scan their code, and pay their fine or cost. Those will be in convenient locations across the state. So in every county, there'll be that option, a Dollar General, for example. And December of next year, we'll look at lessons learned and then, pilot, and then look at what phase two might look like if additional features or functions are required. And again, across the bottom are the stakeholders. 
I know that was fast and furious, but that's the way we like to do things. So at this point, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Well, we're appreciative of that. So, I mean, just asking for a friend, if somebody got a speeding ticket on the way home in Franklin County, the last day of session, when they got to Kenton County, they could maybe scan a QR code and avoid a lot of mailing and there such. yes exactly there would be some delay until that case is actually entered into the case management system and then becomes eligible for payment but yes that's the concept what, what if that same person did it in scott county or grant county maybe on the way home as <laughs> on, well on the way home as well <laughs> then you would have three uh, opportunities to pay online very well um okay great so um uh on, on to the serious though um, and this is a really interesting thing. It kind of gets to the old theory about, you know, methods are many principles or few kind of concept here, which is, you know, the, the, there's very few things, you know, once you get past the basic security that the government provides, one of the fundamental bedrocks of our society is speedy, impartial, and fair justice and, and, and access into the courts. Um, so I, I was the one that interfaced with AOC on trying to, get the money to make sure that we could work towards this because, you know, we've got a backlog inside of the courts, pandemic related, and then this hopefully will help make us more efficient, lower cost delivery of one of those bedrock principles um, to us. Um, my question comes in, in that I'm a little bit concerned about a statement you made and I wanted to make sure because when I was working with you guys, it was my understanding that the money that was being appropriated would handle everything from jailhouse to courthouse to AOC and everything in between that this was kind of an all-in number we had here but you mentioned a concern about funding for ongoing costs mm -hmm. um, so help me understand what that is exactly what you know what, what kind of dollars are we talking about because uh, like I say it's my intent or it was as I drafted this mm -hmm. that this would enca encapsulate everything and listen I you know we get the same thing at work, right? The ongoing right. maintenance costs from the software vendors. And Absolutely. once they've got their fingers in you, you're kind of stuck. But yes, sir. what are we talking about here? Well, I think that since we're still in the research and development stage and we're getting equipment in, we want to be able to see what that equipment can do. And certainly our intent is to leverage all existing equipment in the courtroom that's currently being used. And the jails currently are able to reach out to that and use that as far as recording arraignments into the official court record. So if we were to look at other devices that, for example, might need to be installed in a jail, um, would there be ongoing costs with that for maintenance and support? Potentially. I, I don't think we know the answer to that yet, but certainly our intent would be to minimize those costs. Okay. And, and if we could firm that up a little bit better here in the next 60 days or so because we're going to be dealing with your budget again and if we're going to have something that needs to be addressed i want to make sure we address it but for sure ideally we we are set for all of the equipment system-wide based off of the initial initial dollars that were appropriated there yes sir so, i believe we are okay and great. we will double check that and and let you know if that's not the case all right very well okay uh senator webb i have a <clears throat> couple questions slash comments as a practitioner that's uh somehow survived and tried keep my office open in the past few months and recognizing there is a value to some of the things that you're talking about however I'm sort of of the school that you know speedy isn't always justice and justice in its true form is ex can be expensive so the policy is who's going to pay for it are we going to pay for it and are we really going to have it so what and I think there is a time and place for video arraignment and, and these things however I also feel there's a time and place for the humanity of the ability of a judge to see per in person. For me as an attorney, when there are times I can't get in a jail if the COVID spiked or the restrictions or their scheduling, mm -hmm. it's changed a lot as far as client access mm -hmm. and, and those individuals sitting in there. Now, I see that you have uh, the DPA on your stakeholder list, mm -hmm. but you don't have anybody from the private bar. And we face a lot of different challenges. And, and I also feel like um, if you've got an arraignment and, a, and I file a bond motion, that individual, in my opinion, if a judge is making a decision on a bond motion or a pretrial motion that correlates with arrest uh, or arraignment, you know, they, can, they need to be there in person sometimes. So just I like to have that option of requesting that. 
if I'm going to represent my client and that client's truly going to get justice. And I think that's been left out of some of these equations. And uh, I assure you that there are some of us that will try to make sure that that happens, if not here, from a policy standpoint, in the field, as far as, uh, you know, motions filed. So I, I would say, you know, the private bar needs to be represented here. Our challenges and interests, our interests shouldn't be different, but the application and logistics of it are. And, and I'm just, I sit here year after year, time after time, and the private bar is left off. We're out there making a living, granted. It's hard for us to communicate. But we are the true stakeholders and representing our clients and facing the same challenges. So on behalf of my clients, I feel compelled to make that, that argument. And again, um, the, this interview, guided interview, mm -hmm. sort of disturbs me in a way. I'd like to know more about that especially in the area of, you know, small claims probate, pretty mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. But domestic violence can be highly interpretive and highly damaged to, damaging to an individual that um, is falsely accused. And there are many. And uh, not to, you know, not take anything away from the gravity of an, a, a true domestic violence action. But I'd, I'd like to know a little more about uh, the domestic violence aspect of, of guided interviews, because to me... It could be right for abuse, and I think we need to make sure that safeguard, it affects people's lives. They can't have a gun. The, the, you know, they might lose their job. It, it's a, I want to know more about that before I agree to fund anything along those lines from, from that standpoint. But I, I just think, you know, justice isn't quick and isn't cheap. And if we truly want it, uh, we need to consider the humanitarian side as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for those comments, and absolutely, I think an, engaging the private bar would be helpful on that group as well, so we will take that back and see who we can uh, recruit for that purpose. Thank you for those comments. I heard a volunteer. That's kind of what I was hoping. <laughs> but. Well, I mean, we have the criminal law section of the bar. We have the Kentucky uh, at KCDL. Mm -hmm. There are many members uh, out there that would probably like to have input into this, but thank you. Yeah, I'll help when I can, but another high-paying position. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, other questions, committee, comments? Seeing none. All right. Thank, thank you, you so guys much. very much. Appreciate, we appreciate your, your time. coming today. All right, uh, if everybody will uh, just take note, we had two items that were distributed. Uh, first of all, uh, interim allotment appro uh, adjustments, uh, biggest of those being $12.85 million in uh, restricted funds to the, uh, thur from the Thoroughbred Development Fund to fund purses. Uh, and secondly, there is a list of um, uh, reports received since uh, October of 2021. If anybody has interest in those, it is a quite extensive list um, at this time. Is anybody else, anything on the committee? All right, seeing none, I believe currently this is the last meeting that we're planning on having. Um, and if we don't see, see you folks between here and there, have a happy Thanksgiving, we'll stand adjourned.